One of the most famous prophecies that Jesus makes is about the coming of someone he refers to as the Son of Man. Now many people believe that he's talking about a second coming of himself. And many people believe that this is going to occur some point in the future. Well, the fact is, this coming of Jesus has already occurred. Jesus makes very specific prophecies as to what will happen when the Son of Man makes his visitation. He refers to three key events. The Galilean towns will be crushed, Jerusalem will be encircled with a wall, and the temple will be raised, leaving not one stone atop another. He also states exactly when this individual will come. He says that the Son of Man will appear before the generation that is alive and listening to Jesus' words passes away. Now, to Jews of this era, a generation is 40 years. And so the only individual that could possibly be the Son of Man that Jesus predicts is Titus Flavius. Titus Flavius did destroy the Galilean towns. He did encircle Jerusalem with a wall, and he raised the temple and left not one stone atop another. And he did this within 40 years. Josephus recorded that no matter how Titus tortured the Jews, they refused to call him Lord or God. So to circumvent this stubbornness, the Flavians wrote the Gospels in which a son of man was predicted to come in the future. Titus fulfilled these prophecies and became the son of man. So you end up worshiping Titus without knowing it. To further support his thesis that the Flavians originated Christianity, Joseph Atwell points to the Roman Catholic Church's earliest saints, known as the Christian Flavians. The Flavian family is connected to early Christianity in a number of unusual ways. So many members of the family were recorded as having been among the first Roman Catholic saints. These include Flavia Domitilla, who is either Titus's sister or his niece, and there is an inscription honoring Flavia for donating the land that became the first Christian catacomb. And Flavia Domitilla was the first Christian saint. Her son, Clement, is recorded as having been the first Roman Catholic Pope after the Apostle Simon. In addition, there were two members of the Flavian household staff, Neros and Achilles. Both of them had churches named after them in the very earliest Christian diocese in Rome. There was a Christian theologian whose name was Titus Flavius Clemens, Clement of Alexandria, and he's the one who actually described the first Christian symbols. And he said they were the anchor, the boat, uh, the fish, the olive branch, the star. And oddly, these are the very symbols that the Flavian Caesars used on their coins. The final connecting point between the Flavian family and Christianity is that in the fourth century, Flavius Constantine made Christianity the state religion of Rome. The military achievements of Caesars were important to all Romans. So certainly, the Flavian Christians, the group that the Roman Catholic Church states were the first saints of the religion, would have known the identity of the Son of Man that Jesus predicted, who would crush Galilee and circle Jerusalem with a wall and raise the temple, was Titus Flavius. So it seems, if a person knows how to uncover them, there are actually many clues pointing to the Flavian origin of Christianity. And perhaps the most intriguing one that Joseph Atwell uncovered is a secret code the Flavians used in their documents, which enabled him to make his startling discovery. So the Romans had the Jews' scripture locked up inside their imperial court, and they studied it. And what they discovered 
was that there was a unique literary code hidden in the text. This hidden code, which was common in Jewish scripture, was used by the Flavian literary team to place passages into the Gospels that had to be deciphered to be understood. This hidden literary technique is known as typology. Typology is used throughout the ancient Hebraic literature. And it's a genre that is really no longer understood or used today. But simply put, typology is using events from the past to provide form and context for subsequent ones. What we're talking about is stereotypic, stereotypic. In other words, there's an idealized prototype which shows certain characteristics or performs in certain ways. For instance, one of the things they do is they take an old story and they retell it in a new form. And, uh, and they superimpose contemporary history upon old stories. And, uh, and they create these multi-layered texts. In Hebraic typology, texts were designed to be read in comparison to one another or intertextually and in doing so a meaning that would not be visible in the surface narration would become apparent to someone who understood the typologic connection between the stories. Hebraic typology connects prophets. Events from the life of one prophet are placed into the life of a subsequent prophet and this shows that there is a divine pattern established by God connecting his prophets to one another. The Gospels actually show how we can decipher for ourselves this hidden code or typology that was used to create the Jesus story. At the very beginning of the Gospels, there's a primer of this typology. What the author of Matthew has done is take events from the Old Testament and place them into the life of Jesus. These events occur in the same sequence in the story of Jesus as they occur in the Old Testament. Numerous Bible scholars have already identified the following parallels. Both stories have a patriarch named Joseph who travels from Israel to Egypt. a ruler who massacres innocent boys, a divine character who states that all the men are dead who sought your life, and then a return from Egypt to Israel. This is followed by events which have passing through water. In the Old Testament, the Israelites pass through the Red Sea. In Matthew, Jesus is given a baptism in which he passes through water. We then travel into the wilderness. The Israelites are in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days. Finally, we have the three temptations. In the Old Testament, we have the temptation by bread, the statement, do not tempt God, and the commandment to worship only God. These appear again in Matthew, where Jesus is tempted by bread, tells the devil, do not tempt God, and instructs him to worship only God. Therefore, when you compare the life of Jesus with the life of Moses, you see a linkage that shows that the character in the Gospels was divinely connected to the character in the Old Testament. The life of the first savior of Israel, Moses, foresaw the life of Jesus, who is now claiming to be the next savior of Israel. To understand the rest of the Jesus story, his adult ministry, we simply need to know that the same system of parallel names, locations, and concepts occurring in the same sequence was used to connect Jesus in the Gospels to Titus in the works of Josephus. Our scholars explain this gospel typology in the following three examples.
Jesus comes to the Sea of Galilee at the beginning of his ministry. He gathers his disciples to him and he says, do not be afraid, follow me and become fishers of men. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus actually says catchers of men. Titus comes to the same location, to the Sea of Galilee. He gathers his troops, his disciples together and he says, don't be afraid. And then he leads them. They follow him and they attack a group of, of Jewish rebels. They sink the Jews' boats. The Jews attempt to swim to safety and the Romans use their spears to catch them. They become fishers of men. The match isn't exact, but we should never expect it to be exact. It's simply a, a type which is repeated across the whole of the New Testament. Jesus is constantly dealing with devils. Josephus also deals with devils, but Josephus defines who these devils are. He states that the devils are those individuals who have a rebellious spirit and rebel against Rome. At Gadara, Jesus encounters one man who has a legion of demons inside his mind. They then are driven out by Jesus. They infect a herd of swine, and then this herd rushes wildly into the water. This is a parallel to Titus's battle at Gadara where one individual infects an entire legion of Jews with his demonic spirit, and then that group in turn infects another group, and this combined group is driven by the Romans into the sea. What's being suggested here is that this story that you find in the Gospels is in some ways sort of like a, a grim parable about that military event. It's sort of like a bit tongue in cheek, I think, Romans had a vicious sense of humour like this, a very black sense of humour. In a medieval text that I've studied, which is called the Gospel of Barnabas, when you read that story, the way it's presented is in an unsophisticated form, that is to say it's sort of been decoded in some ways, and it, it becomes clear that, what's, uh, that uh, what we're talking about here are um, the Jewish rebels are chased into the sea and they drown in the sea. In the Gospels, these are presented as pigs. This is, a, this is a, a, once again, a very dark, black sort of Roman sense of humor. Some of this literature really needs to be understood like that. In Josephus's biography, he describes when he was in the entourage of Titus during the closing stages of the siege of Jerusalem, he chanced upon three of his friends who were being crucified. And he pleaded with Titus for their release. And Titus gave that permission and the three figures were removed from the cross. Two of them died and one revived. Now, if you're looking for a stereotypic example of how some idea was floated into the mind of someone writing the Gospels, that is a pretty clear example. It's certainly a strange occurrence that we find such an incident in the works of Josephus when it shows up in such a dramatic form in the Gospels. In the Gospels, Joseph of Arimathea asked the Roman commander to take Jesus down from the cross. In Josephus's history, Joseph Barmatheus asked the Roman commander to take someone down from the cross. Arimathea is a pun on Josephus' last name, Barmatheus. When you read our sources really carefully, and you have to do it really, really carefully, because uh, they didn't spell it out for us, it's, uh, it's effectively very well hidden. Um, we have to understand that our literature, a lot of our literature is essentially propaganda. The Romans are not writing objective history and all of our literature has been through Roman filters. Perhaps that's the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that uh, this is literature that hasn't been through the Roman filters.